Let me go ahead and get that started so I don't forget. <laughs> so welcome everyone to our Time for Genetics family conversation. And we're just gonna give everybody just a moment more here to join and then we will get started. Just sent out a reminder to our clinics. So hopefully there'll be a couple others that will join. Some of them I know are coming from seeing patients. So um, I'll give it one more minute and we'll go ahead and get started. And then just don't be dis di um, distraught if people join in the middle because that sometimes happens as well. And then they catch the, the recording and the piece that they miss. I did get, did get an email this morning from one of our clinics that had a meeting come up. So uh, they have asked for the recording, so. Sylvia, do you have folks joining with you from your office? Hi, this is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Nice to see you. Yes. All right, well, we are gonna go ahead and get started. We have a couple other clinics that might be joining um, midway through and a couple others that let us know that they have patients today and are not able to, to join. So we're going, we are recording this and we will be sharing that with everyone as well. So welcome everyone to Time for Genetics. This is our fourth month um, in our topic of red flags for genetics. And our fourth month is, uh, has a family focus about uh, family conversations. And so this um, this month, uh, as, as the, for the previous three, where you've been talking about red flags for genetics. And um, today we are so excited to welcome um, two um, genetic ambassadors and Colorado State team members um, with us today. Um, I will introduce them in a moment, um, but just wanted to uh, acknowledge our HRSA funding as we always do um, in our in our videos here in our recordings. Um, we are thankful for the funding that makes this program possible. And um, just a reminder, I'm Christy Weiss. I'm the projects manager for, for Mountain States and leading up the Time for Genetics program. So with that, I thought we would start off with introductions from our clinics. This is our clinic map. We have seven clinics participating in this round one. And it looks like we have Sylvia and Carrie from New Mexico, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Go. <laughs> okay, I'm Carrie Hopes. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner here in Taos. Sylvia Villarreal, pediatrician, Taos. Great, thanks for joining us. And um, Elizabeth, I see that you joined. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I can't get my camera to work, but I'm Elizabeth DePrince Smith. I'm a certified nurse pediatric nurse practitioner up in Laramie, Wyoming. And my partner and I just opened our own practice. So we are fully Meadowlark Pediatrics. Congratulations. I was gonna I was gonna email you about that. So I'm glad to hear. Congratulations. Thank you. Great. It takes and ovaries. I ah ha, ha, ha. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think that's all the clinics we have online right at this moment. As I said, some others might be joining. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears here and um, introduce our two guests today. Um, we have Brittany Park from Colorado and Heather Schichtel from Colorado. And they are going to be sharing much more about their stories. They are both part of our Colorado State team and our genetic ambassador group um, and have some really powerful stories to share today about red flags and their own family's personal stories. Um, and at the end, what, what we plan to do is just share, have them share their stories both each, then open it up for question and answer. And then we have some discussion questions as well if we have time at the end, because um, we really want this to be informal and interactive. So um, that's what we have planned for, planned for today. So with that, um, Brittany has said that she would go first. So I will turn it over to Brittany and I'm gonna put myself on mute so I don't distract you. Do you have a, do you have a do you have a kid request? If you need to take it, go ahead. 
<clears throat> no, 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 she's totally fine. She just, I told her that when I'm talking, she can't sing in the background. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you... If you hear humming, that's just my little Riley over here. Um, but thank you, Christy. Uh, like she said, my name is Brittany Park and I do live in Colorado. Um, I am the mother to four children, um, but really here today to talk about two of them, my two boys. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much to the clinics for um, who are able to participate today and who will be watching this recording afterwards. Hopefully we can... Um, portray our stories and hopefully have a good discussion today about the red flags. Um, but I'm very appreciative of your participation in this, in this whole program, and especially today for the red flags um, and the family perspective. Um, I also wanted to put it out there that if you have any questions while I'm, while I'm talking and sharing my story or afterwards, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we can um, discuss that later. And, and to know that, um, you know, certainly talking about our families is sensitive, but please feel free to ask questions and I'm happy to answer um, just about anything from, from you today as well. Um, so to, to begin, I'm gonna talk about my first, my first son. So he was our, actually our second child and his name was Drew. Um, he was born uh, in May of 2011 um, and we were living in upstate New York at the time. He, I, again, he was my second child, so it was, you know, not, not my first go around with pregnancy and birth, and uh, for, it was a normal pregnancy, a normal birth. When he was born, it was a, he had a normal APGAR score. Um, his newborn screen came back all within limits, so nothing was flagged um, with the newborn screening. We went home thinking everything was normal and happy. Um, and my husband and I started having some concerns for our our newborn really within the first couple of weeks of birth. And when we, when we would go back to the pediatrician at our subsequent well child checkups, we would express those concerns with our pediatrician. And, and really the, the first one that started showing up was feeding. Um, I was exclusively breastfeeding him at that time. Um, and he, he had um, latch difficulties. And so he, rather than being able to, to really get a good um, latch, he would leak milk everywhere. And it was like just a mess um, trying to nurse him all the time. Um, and the, you know, another concern that we had for our son was that he was sleeping all the time and I had to wake him up to eat. He didn't really seem to want to, to eat. Um, and so then, you know, another concern that came a little bit later on was that he, wasn't tracking anything with his eyes um, uh, and movement. He could hear us, but he wasn't really, you know, wouldn't follow toys and things like that. And then the last biggest concern we had for him was he's just really floppy um, and he had a low muscle tone. And so we would, we'd bring these concerns up to our pediatrician and every, you know, multiple times. And we kept getting reassured. He's a normal, healthy baby boy. Like, it's okay if he leaks a little bit of milk and um, really felt quite dismissed by, by the concerns we were having from our pediatrician at the time. Um, and then when we went for our two month checkup was kind of a big turning point for our family. And that was when they did the head circumference measurements, his head circumference actually came out smaller in the measurement than the previous month um, head circumference. And I was really concerned about that, but the, the nurse and the pediatrician both had said, well, maybe the measurement from the month before was just wrong. I was like, well, we have all these other concerns and his head circumference is weird. You could also kind of see some, some bumps on his head where just looked funny. Honestly, I didn't know how to, just to describe it besides it looked different. Um, and so I kind of put my foot down and insisted upon something. I said, just do something. I don't know what it is, but please do something. And so um, our pediatrician ordered an x-ray and we went that day for an x-ray of his skull. Um, and uh, we were told after waiting for about an hour in the waiting room after the x-ray, oh, he's fine. You can go ahead and go home. Um, unfortunately, we, we requested those records years later, um, and the technician for that x-ray had recommended a CT scan based on the overlapping sutures of his skull. 
Um, two days after that x-ray was when Drew suffered his very first major seizure. Um, we were driving in the car at the time and he was, I had to perform CPR um, while we waited for the ambulance. The ambulance came, took him to the hospital um, where they admitted him for 24 hours. And despite really pushing and feeling like there was something serious going on, he was eventually discharged um, with a diagnosis of acid reflux. And so they gave us a really high dose of acid reflux medication and said, you know, he's totally fine, just take him home. Um, my sister-in-law had all of, there was family history of really severe acid reflux in her family. So they thought, well, that just must be what it is. Severe acid reflux, he stopped breathing because he was protecting his airway. Um, I wish that was the case, <laughs> um, but four days later, he suffered another major seizure, stopped breathing. We had to call 911, performed CPR, um, and it was truly the EMT that came to our house that, that was the first that gave us a clue and finally heard us that something serious was going on. He said, you know, your son just had a seizure, um, and he stayed at our house with us and said, you know, if we take you by ambulance, if you're going to sit in the ER for hours and hours and hours, your son needs to be directly admitted to the hospital. So we called our pediatrician with the EMT sitting right there with us and said, we need you to do a direct admit to the hospital. And she was, you know, our pediatrician was like, you know, I think he's really okay. Just take him in the ambulance. And finally the EMT got on the phone and said, listen, this kid just had a seizure. He's seriously, his oxygen levels are still really low he needs to be directly admitted. And so finally the pediatrician agreed, took him to the hospital. She didn't think anything was wrong still. So they didn't put an IV in. He was just like a, an observation for, for 24 hours in the hospital. Well, the next morning he coded. He had another major seizure and he was code blue. And because he didn't have an IV in, they were not able to give him any Ativan for his seizure. Um, he had a serious seizure for a little over 15 minutes where he was, you know, having to get oxygen. Um, and the, the pediatric team was working to get an IV in him. So then from, from that point on, finally, it seemed like people were ready to listen, listen to us as something serious was going on. Um, and so from, from that seizure, he was admitted to the pediatric ICU. He had some extensive blood work an MRI, which showed severe brain atrophy. Um, but it still took us over a week to see a metabolic or genetic specialist, what, even though he was in the hospital. Um, so I finally diagnosed him with homocysteinuria. He had severely elevated homocysteine. Um, and if you're familiar with that classification, there's classical homocysteinuria, and there's also cobalamin disorders, which are all classified by a letter A, B, C, D, D1, E, F, G, J, and X. Um, and so we knew, and he was diagnosed in this category of these cobalamin disorders that caused high homocysteine in their, in their body. He also had basically no methionine in his body. It was very, very, very low. So his brain was being starved, um, all nutrients. He was eventually put on a ventilator, um, because he was having trouble breathing. It was, his seizures were out of control despite all the medication we were putting him on. And, um, after he came off the ventilator, when he started making progress with medication, he had such severe brain damage. He still could not sustain life and, and breathe. And so he did pass away at three and a half months old from all the damage done from the metabolic disorder. Um, and so we, we knew we had this, this disorder in our family. We knew it was genetic. We knew that, that it was in this family of cabalamin. We just didn't know which one. So we spent years and a lot of money to, to try to figure out what those genetic mutations were because we were really hoping to have more children. Um, we, we were able to figure out some of the genetic mutations that kind of could red flag our kids as far as screening them before they were born. And um, so fast forward to 2019, eight years later, I was pregnant with our now second son and fourth child, and he was screened in vitro and was shown to have the same genetic mutations for the disorder as our son drew. Um, and so we had a completely different experience um, 
when, once we got these results for the genetic testing, we met with the team at Colorado Children's Hospital. And even though that diagnosis wasn't 100% of, you know, confirmed for Grayson, even though it was similar to Drew's, I delivered at the Children's Hospital. He was immediately tested. He was um, then officially diagnosed with homocystinuria cobalamin G. Um, we were able to test for that. And he has been getting treated since day one with oral medications, injections, and he is doing phenomenal. Thankfully, he is two and definitely a two-year-old, he's got, um, he's developmentally normal. He is thriving and he is naughty and I love it because he is, <laughs> you know, he's, he's doing what he should be doing. And it was, um, it's been uh, really a privilege to be able to advocate on behalf of my own two boys and um, advocate to as far as for other families in the future and you know the red flags that they that they see and this creating this document and the red flags with the family the family input well meant a lot to me just because i was able to show um you know really put in my input as far as the concerns that we had and how i can help other families move forward with the concerns they have in speaking with their pediatrician and as well as pediatricians being able to help families understand the concerns that are there that could relate to a genetic disorder so thank you so much and if you have any questions um, about our family or um you know the red flags that we saw please feel free to ask and and let me know so i'll turn the time over to heather who's going to share her story as well. Thank you so much, Brittany, for, for sharing um, all of Drew and Grayson's story. And um, with that, I'll, I'll ask Heather if, if she's, she's ready to share hers and then any questions then we can address after both of their stories. Does that work? Absolutely. So hello, everyone. And um, Brittany, before um, I go into my story, I just, I want to say how sorry I am about all of this and um, with Drew and, and everything that you had to go through and you hear these stories and um, it's it like my heart is beating a little fast right now because it's it's just they're, they're heartbreaking stories and um, unfortunately there are so many among this rare disease community um, I'm truly so very sorry and how brave you are for um for continuing to expand your family that that takes um an enormous amount of courage so and and then to advocate for other families so many kudos to you and then for all of our providers um Thank you so much. I'm seeing, you know, providers in Taos, and providers, um, I think it, it was Casper, someone mentioned. Um, thank you for being here. This really, um, it means so much, especially being in more of a rural area where perhaps you don't always have access to, to these bigger hospital systems. So thank you for being a part of this. Um, I'm Heather Schichtel. I am here because of my two children, um, Jack and Samantha. Um, we lived in a somewhat rural area when we decided to, um, to start a family. We were up in Loveland, um, which is about an hour outside of Denver. Um, I became pregnant with our first child, Jack, um, and I want to say it was a, an okay pregnancy. It was a tough pregnancy. Um, there were a lot of things that kind of, in hindsight, um, pointed to the fact that maybe there was something wrong. Um, I had polyhydramnias, um, hydra um, quite a lot of water um, it, you know, within my uterus. Um, I was huge in carrying just one baby. Um, there were a couple other things that just were red flags looking back um, that I was just told, you know, hang on there, we're gonna deliver this baby. Um, I went in to be induced and um, they could not find a heartbeat. And so Jack was stillborn. Um, we, a year later, had our daughter, Samantha. And the pregnancy was monitored closer. It wasn't quite as wonky as our pregnancy with Jack, but there were still a couple things that, that were pointers to um, it was not a normal pregnancy. Um, Samantha was born, her APGAR score, you know, same as Drew, APGAR score looked good. Um, newborn screening came back. 
came back clear. The one marker that she did has, have is she kept um, failing her hearing test. Um, but babies fail their hearing test, right? That happens. Um, her ability to latch on was lacking. She did not eat well. Um, she had jaundice um, to the point where we were in the hospital for an extra five days because they just, they couldn't get, they couldn't get her, her blood levels right. And I remember at one point, a nurse came to me and said, when you feed her, does she turn blue? <laughs> And should have kind of been a marker, but um, me coming off of an incredibly tough pregnancy and having lost my first child, I was so sensitive to the fact of, I cannot wrap my head around the fact that something might be wrong with this baby. And um, so we took Samantha home and, you know, similar markers, Brittany, as you were explaining, you know, really floppy baby, slept a lot, um, did not latch on. I would pump and then we would, we would bottle feed her. And then about 30 minutes later, she would, she would throw everything up. And it wasn't just a throwing up, but it was like nothing had been digested, just, just projectile vomiting. And so we struggled with that. Um, she was, when she was born, she weighed seven and a half pounds. At six months, she weighed 12. So clearly not gaining the weight that, that she needed. Um, our pediatrician was right, on, right in denial with us. So um, I would take her in. I'm like, I'm concerned about her feeding. We feed her around the clock. And he would tell me, you know, you had, you had a loss before this and you know first time babies are really hard and um you know just 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 you're, you're doing fine she's doing fine um there are again lack of muscle tone lack of eye contact lack of smiling lack of i had the book um you know that the first what is the book it's not what what to expect in the first year and i would read it and i'm like we're not doing that we're not doing this, we're not doing that. Um, at the pediatrician's office, there were certain milestones. We weren't meeting any of them, but our pediatrician was like, it's, she's just a little, she just, she just needs some time. She was also, because of Jack, we, and we were induced at four weeks. So that was another thing he kept saying is, you know, she was a little early. Maybe she just needs a little more time. Um, at four months, I put my foot down and I said, there is something going on. And um, he referred us to um, a PT, a physical therapist. Um, and things just kind of went along like that until we were up in the mountains and um, Samantha was having a really hard time, I think, with the lack of oxygen um, being up in Vail. And we were, we were coming back down. She had this gray ashen color to her. And I said to my husband, I'm like, I, I can't do this any longer. I can't pretend that something is not wrong with our baby. And so um, we were driving down to Denver. We stopped off at Children's Hospital. She was admitted immediately into the ICU. All of her blood gas, all of her levels were, um, were, were completely off the charts. Um, and that's kind of where our journey began. From there, um, like I said, we were in the ICU. Samantha ended up being diagnosed with uh, mitochondrial disease. So and the tough thing about mitochondria is that since it is an energy disease, there were times where Samantha's energy was okay and she looked pretty good. And there were other times where she just, she looked awful. Um, and even when we were at um, Children's, you know, the whole diagnostic journey takes time. Um, we, were, we were in the ICU, um, she was incredibly dehydrated. Some of her level, you know, some of her, her levels began to, to normalize. We left there after 10 days um, getting tubes in her ears. That was the only thing that they did because again, she kept, she kept failing her hearing tests. So we took her home. Um, we were home for about a week. She started to have seizures, um, took her back into, into children's. They, um, they, they put in a feeding tube and a Nissen because she still wasn't gaining the weight that she needed to. 
Um, we were consulted with a geneticist who ran a series of tests, but um, mitochondrial disease is one of those that is hard to, it's, it's hard to identify immediately. So nothing really poignant came back. The mutation that we carry is a pol G1 mutation and those that mutation does not immediately show up um, when you screen for mitochondrial disease because it's not part of that mDNA. We were able after, after, so Brittany, you were telling your story about seizures. We went back and forth um, to Children's in the course of a month about three times. At one time, she was airlifted to Children's. They gave her, um, they gave her a big dose of Ativan. It was a Friday night and they were like, you know what? She looks okay. So we took her home that Friday night. <laughs> Like who gets airlifted to children's and then goes home that same day. And we were right back in on Monday morning where our neurologist sat down with us and said, um, we're, we're not taking you home um, until we get this figured out. We, we had four great years with Samantha. Um, we had an incredible care team. Um, she like many kiddos with mitochondrial disease, it was a multi-system, um, medically complex situation that we were dealing with. Um, she had feeding issues, she um, had seizures, um, failure to thrive, but those four years were amazing. They really, she, um, she was such a gift to all of us. Um, after she passed, we started a nonprofit here in Colorado called Miracles for Mito, which um, we actually serve the Rocky Mountain region. So um, y'all in Wyoming, everyone in New Mexico, if you have a child that has that diagnosis, um, we're, we're more than happy to help. Um, again, I will give my contact information as well. Um, I've been working with um, the folks that are part of um, it's not the San Diego hospital, but anyway, Project Baby Bear out in California, which really advocates for whole genome sequencing for all infants who, when there is a suspected genetic disease or genetic condition um, where they can immediately get that sequencing, um, no matter their ability to pay. Um, it's, that was our journey and that it took to be perfectly honest, when Samantha passed, we still had not gotten a confirmed um, mitochondrial diagnosis. Um, but like many genetic diseases, uh, about that same time, my brother developed a foot drop. He was walking along and his right foot would just drop. And um, he had a stroke-like episode where they brought Ryan into, um, he, he was being seen at the University of Colorado. They brought him in there and he has an adult onset mitochondrial disease. So this pull G1 deviation manifested in Ryan who was a, was a normal child, uh, you know, a, 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 a typical child. I hate to use the word normal because who is normal, but um, a developing child went on to, you know, being a great young adult. He was a CPA and now, um, at age 46, he's on SSI and um, walks with a walker. So um, that's why I'm here. Genetics are part of who we are. And it is a, a really um, tough discussion. I look at Brittany where, you know, had had things been different, you know, her, her, her son would still be here. Um, and I think it's, it's important. I, I wish our pediatrician would have recognized the signs and um, I, I don't think it would have changed our outcome. I know it would not have, but it would, um, I think in, in hindsight, the times where she coded, the times where she had seizures, we were very lucky that we were able to get those four years. That's me. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you both for, for sharing which, what I know are very, very personal and, and heart-wrenching stories for both of you. But um, uh, I, know, I know these two ladies and I've known these two ladies for a long time and I know they're really here to um, just share so that it makes it easier for another family um, behind them on the journey. So thank you. Thank you both. Um,